Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Amy Kohler from Dakota College at Botnos. I am, as last week, I am the specialty crop instructor and technician here at Dakota College at Botno. And this is our part two to our specialty crop integrated pest management webinar series taking place every Tuesday in May uh, in the afternoon from noon to one central time. And I'd like to welcome everyone that has joined us live and then also those who are watching the recorded sessions that we will be posting um, once the, the live sessions are complete. Uh, just for everyone knows, the first part of this webinar series was last Tuesday, where we discussed just an introduction to integrated pest management and pests in general and some of the history behind pesticide and pest management use. And then this week, we are going to be talking about pest identification. I am really excited to share this with you. Um, and a lot of this pest identification we're going to be looking at is really geared toward North some, some pretty common North Dakota pests. Um, like I've said when our, my past lecture, there is just so much material I could be covering over these four webinar series. Um, and then the same thing with pest identification. There are much more um, disease and insects related pests out there that, you know, everyone, everyone's farm and everyone's specialty crop production is a little bit different. And everyone does seem to experience, you know, a variety of different pests. But I'm hoping that the ones that I've chose to cover today are probably your, some of the most common. And I'm pr pretty sure at least you've all experienced one, if not all, or half of the pests that we'll be going over today. So hopefully everyone will be able to utilize some of this information. And then at the end of very end of the lecture or the sorry, the webinar series today, I will give you guys a really great resource, uh, online resource that can be utilized to help do some identification of your pest issues as well. So I'm gonna ask that everyone please mute their mics. Um, and then if you have any questions, you can always unmute or you can use the chat box as we go. And I'll also have some time at the end, hopefully, to answer some questions as well. But I am going to get started because there's a lot of information I'm going to be going over. I'm really hoping we can get through every pest on here. Uh, but if not, I will continue until I've gone through the whole PowerPoint. But of course, if individuals need to have other things scheduled, if we go past 1 p.m., uh, I will then this is being recorded and they'll be posted if you'd like to catch what you might have missed. Um, <laughs> Alrighty. So like I said, this is going to be a pest identification. A lot of the information I'm utilizing today, I have, uh, I have used or was been able to source through the University of Minnesota Extension. They have a really, some really great online sources for gardeners and especially crop producers in their pest identification. And the neat thing about University of Minnesota is a lot of the pests, the majority of issues they have we also here have here in North Dakota because they have some of this us not completely the same type of environments that we have but it can be very similar um, and it's probably out of all of the extension services around our state probably the most extensive in its identification tools and information about individual pests. And why is it important to identify your pests? Well, um, when it comes back to integrated pest management, you can't start management um, and control of a pest if you don't know what you're looking at and you don't know a little bit of background information about that pest, such as life cycle and things like that, because certain pesticides, especially our generation four pesticides we talked about last year, and then also some of our cultural controls and things like that have to do with the different life cycles and different stages of the pest life and tend to affect different stages and uh, parts of that pest life. So the first round of pests we're going to be talking about are insect slash bug pests. And I say that with parentheses, uh, quotation marks, because I know for two of the ones I have listed here aren't technically insects. So um, the two on here that aren't actually insects would be slugs. Those, I believe, are in the mollusk family. And then spider mites, of course, are in the arachnid family, the same as spiders. But besides that, they're usually kind of lumped into that insect pest bug uh, issue. And a lot of times life cycles still have a lot to do with these guys. So besides those two, majority of these are insects. And so we're going to go over really quickly some very basic insect information that will help you kind of understand some of the background and entomology having to do with pests. And like I said, I could do a whole hour just on entomology, understanding the science behind but we just don't have time today. So hopefully this will be enough to kind of get you some background information, make some of the connections I'll be talking about. So insect basics. Uh, most insects, uh, true insects, have three parts, a head, a thorax, 
a thorax and an and abdomen. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and then something to always remember, they all are cold blooded. But the really important part um, about insects and an understand about insects pests is that insect pests are usually divided into two major categories of how they affect the plant material they are preying upon. And that has to do with their mouth part. So insects can are either usually have a piercing or sucking mouth part or a chewing mouth part. And but depending on what type of mouth part they have, that's what's going that's going to indicate be indicated by the type of damage they create on our specialty crops. So we have the piercing and sucking mouth parts as you can see right here. Um, this is kind of a front view and a good example of a, a, a piercing or sucking type of mouth part insect would be an aphid. And what these kind of injuries, the idea is they have that, that front mouthpiece that inserts and sucks or pierces the plant material um, and, and is able to damage it that way. And you usually will see something along the lines of wilting plants, uh, dead tissue spots, and then a lot of the piercing and sucking insects give off this substance called honeydew uh, and uh, that is kind of this sticky sweet looking substance uh, that is a really good sign that if you can't see the insect then if you see the honeydew is a very good example especially if you're working with specialty crops in a greenhouse setting if anyone has any experience with uh, mealybugs uh, they give off a lot of honeydew it's this really sticky gross back uh, <laughs> sticky stuff um, that they give off especially the kind of like a poop kind of stuff secretion but that's kind of a good sign for those guys. And then you have your chewing insects, or they have the chewing mouth parts, where they have the mandibles, um, a different, some kind of shape and form mandible instead of a piercing um, front end. And these guys will usually leave some type of hole or missing plant, plant material versus or spots. Um, but and we'll continue on through with that. So once you kind of break things down by the type of damage they create, insects can be also divided in the type of life cycle they, they have. So we did talk about the importance of understanding a little bit of the life cycle of the pest you're dealing with. Um, and most insects are divided into one of two um, life cycles, and that's complete versus incomplete. Uh, with the complete life cycle, you have an egg to larval stage. Um, you know, to pupa to adults. So there's about four different stages, as you can see here, um, with the complete met or metamorphosis is also it's actually the technical term for a life cycle for a pest. You might be familiar with metamorphosis with butterflies are usually utilized a lot in that terms. Uh, and then when you have your simple or incomplete metamorphosis, there's kind of a step missing. So it goes from egg to larval, which is usually it's a nymph stage, then to adult. So it kind of really gets rid of, even though they both have that fourth step, um, with the complete metamorphosis, you have more of a pupae stage, which is a much more soft body um, type of the insect, whereas with the... Um, with the with the in, incomplete, they really it kind of goes past that pupa stage. So they don't really have as many of that. What? No, versions of that. Of I I'm sorry. Someone is is not muted. Could we make sure everyone's muted so we all can hear what's going on? Thank you. <laughs> um, so with the incomplete, you'll have you miss that soft body stage. So really, you just have two nymph stages where it's they're both very similar to the adult form. Uh, just very smaller and tend to be maybe a little less hard body, but are a little bit, um, it does affect a little bit on what type of insect pesticide management you'd be utilizing. And we'll talk about that more next, um, the, on the fourth week when we talk about actual pest management. And then something to always remember, um, telling immature insects from, ad uh, from adults is usually a good rule of thumb. If there's wings present, it's an adult. If there's no wings, usually it's, an, it's some, type, some shape or form immature uh, version of that or younger, you know, of that adult state, that, that insect stage of life. There we go. All right, so like I said, uh, with complete, you're looking more like your moth flies and beetles. Incomplete, aphids and grasshoppers are a really good example of something along those life, style, life cycles. All right, so is there any questions about just a, that, the general basis about like different mouth parts and, and um, life cycles of these, these pests or insects? Okay, awesome. So the very first pest we're going to talk about today, and like I said, a lot of these pests between our research and our specialty crop block grant, and then also just hearing feedback and our and own personal 
experience working with specialty crop producers, I'm trying to do probably the most common, or at least what I've seen is some of the most common pest issues that we've had. And if I did miss a pest today that you're really um, interested about, you can always contact me or utilize the resources that I'll give you at the end of the presentation. But the very first pest we're going to talk about is the Colorado potato beetle, or sometimes just called the CPB. Um, and so these guys, all adult, these guys are pretty much your big predations for your, so your, your nightshade family. So your peppers, your tomatoes, not peppers, not so much, but you really see these guys affecting your tomatoes. And probably if you are, you grow eggplant, eggplants and you've had these issues with your eggplants, you will definitely notice. They can affect tomatoes and peppers technically, but I don't tend to see these guys having a, such a big issue. They tend to add their most devastation with individuals who have their potato or their um, eggplant varieties. Oh, and tomatillos. Those are also in the nightshade. I know some producers have had issues with these guys with their tomatillos. And so we're going to go through a little bit about the life cycle of these guys and how to identify this is what you have. So in the picture you see here, this is the adult stage or the adult beetle of that Colorado potato beetle. Um, these guys are usually active from June to September. They're oval in shape, about three eighths long, and then they also have a really yellowy orange thorax. So that kind of that stripe with that yellow and orange there is a really good indication of these adults. And, the, and then we get into the larva stages as well. So they're pretty easy to identify. Um, so what, usually the females will lay these bright orange yellowish clusters of oval eggs and you'll be able to see them and usually it's on the back side of the leaf and you'll definitely be able to identify them once you know what to look for. And then when they're in their larval stage, because usually when you have uh, adults present, you'll also have, you'll be able to almost see the full stage of life cycle all present on the same plant if you have an infestation of this bad. Um, so uh, once you get to that, you'll also see a larval stage and these guys usually will, first you'll start with the adults that come up in the spring and we'll talk about that and then the heart larva will come out eventually. Um, and they're more of a brick red with black spots and I'll show you guys a picture in a few seconds. Um, and then they can, to get, as they get older, they get more pink or salmon color. Um, and they have these two rows of dark spots on either side of their bodies. As you can see here, and this is not a good picture, I'll see it closer, this would be the larval stage. So definitely very soft body insect here on the, I believe it'll be your guys' left, um, for the dark head and those really distinct um, black spots down the body or abdomen thorax of that, of that larva. And then the adult beetle with those really distinct black stripes with orange head. Um, so the life cycle of these guys, um, they do overwinter in potato fields or wheat field margins, somewhere underground, windbreaks, gardens, they can definitely overwinter. Um, then adults will feed for a short time in the spring and then begin to mate in like clusters of eggs of 10 to 30 eggs on the underside of leaves. And these guys can reproduce pretty fast. They're definitely one of those, um, when we get into monitoring and scouting next week, um, they're one of those ones that you need to kind of be constant with your monitoring and scouting because if you walk away for a few weeks and these guys are there, um, you can come back to losing quite a bit of, of plant material to these guys. Um, each female, and this is a good example, each female can lay up to 350 eggs, um, you know, during their actual adult lifespan, which is only in several weeks. So these guys really tend to overtake things quickly. Um, and then the eggs usually, once you see the adults first emerging, you're gonna, the eggs are gonna be hatching in about two weeks. And that's really, and the nice thing about these guys, it really depends on temperature. And we'll talk about how temperature really plays a big role in, um, and we will later also in management, but also for when to look for these guys. Um, so then the larval will cluster near the egg mass when the young, and then they'll start to move out as they eat the plant and leaves. So the adults and the larva stages both eat on this plant. That's another good example um, sometimes with certain pests, only one stage will eat that host plant that you're trying to prevent. These guys, when I'm out of the stage, will be eating on this plant. And then once those larvae are in their full development, they will then go down the plant into the soil, where they will then in the soil, uh, they will kind of, they'll create, they'll uh, have this pupae stage where they will turn into, and that's when they're in the soil, and then they merge back from the soil as the adult and come back up and start laying their eggs. Uh, so it's a very continuous cycle on these guys. Uh, and then also, 
Um, and that's usually, so the larva usually will grow about four different times before, um, get the four different stages of growth before they become that pupae. Sorry, I cut off that photo a little bit with the pupae. Um, before they try to go and burrow down the plant and burrow into the ground below and turn into that adult beetle. Some really common, if usually when you have uh, Colorado potato damage on these guys, a um, really good sign is you're going to see them because some pests you may not, you may see the damage before you see the pest. With Colorado potato beetles, if you have damage, you will see the pests. Um, maybe really early in the spring, um, you might only see the adults, but if you're seeing where your leaves are just being destroyed and all you have left is stems, um, it's probably Colorado potato beetle. They're very, very common. Um, and you will usually see, after a while, you will see all three stages, um, except for the pupae of the four. The adult, the, this is, has a lot of larvae in this photo, or on the underside, you'll see that cluster of eggs, which can be seen by the naked eye. And then some just real quick facts about these guys, which will kind of play a bit more when we get into the management side of things, um, is they are a major potato pest throughout North America. They feed on eggplant, tomato, pepper, and of course any other plant in the nightshade family. We talked about that. Uh, they're usually active in the spring when the potatoes emerge. For us in North Dakota, especially zone threes, you're probably not going to see them. It's going to be closer than June um, because right here is a really good point. Um, these adults, the adults that first emerge in the spring from the ground after overwintering, they're not able to even fly until the day temperatures reach at least 70 degrees. So if you're, and one of the things we'll talk about management with these guys about crop rotation um, and trapping and things like that, you don't really need to start worrying about these guys with your potato crops until your average day temperatures are at least reaching 70 degrees. So it's a really cool spring and we're not getting a lot of consistent 70 degree days until early June. Um, you may not have to worry about these guys so much. And with our way our temperatures go anyways, and when a lot of our producers tend to plant, it's not such an, a big deal. And then the biggest thing about um, Colorado potato beetles is their prime example of how over pesticide use has become very ineffective because they are really good at um, um, developing resistance to your traditional chemical pesticides. And we'll get into some more other management issues. And there's a lot of management um, combinations you can utilize and some actual really great uh, information that we found with our project with finding some, some new innovative ways of dealing with uh, collar potato beetles, uh, something to do with mulching and things like that, interrupting that life cycle we'll talk about in week four. All right, and that's collar potato beetles. Hopefully you guys will be able to identify these guys. They're, they're pretty, I wouldn't say they're simple to identify, but one of the easier pests if you know what you're looking for. Next, if you've had cold crops and you, you're in North Dakota, anywhere near a canola field, you probably have a flea beetle issue. Um, these guys are pretty common. I have heard of parts of North Dakota who've never had issues with flea beetles, and I say you're a very, very lucky person if you've never had to deal with these guys because they are a pain. Um, and these, like I said before, these guys really, really do like your, your coal crop. So your, your kale, your lettuces, your cabbages, your broccolis, your cauliflowers, um, spinach, they just, they will just destroy them. And they're these little black beetles. There's a couple of different varieties. Um, and and I've, I'll, in this next slide, I've kind of listed some of the other there's multiple species and they tend, and each one tends to have a little bit of what they will affect more, but you, usually you have two or three different species going on and they tend to affect most of your cold crops. Um, they are in the Chrysomaladia family and I know I'm completely butchering that. Um, but usually their the adult flea beetles are anywhere from 1 16th to an 18th inch long. So they're pretty small. They're, you know, usually they're these black little bouncing specks kind of idea. Um, the exception of the blue, um, the spinach flea beetle, which is about a quarter inch long, they're a little bit bigger. Um, and then usually it can be black, brown, bronze, bluish brown to metallic gray. Um, and then some species will have stripes. And then all uh, flea beetles have large back legs, which they use for jumping. They're really good jumpers, especially when you move around that plant. I'm sure you've, if you've worked with a kale plant that's been just completely covered and you get near it, they just little jump everywhere. Um, some of the most common flea beetles in North Dakota is your Crucifer flea beetle, striped flea beetle, western black flea beetle, potato flea beetle, and spinach flea beetle. Um, most flea beetles do feed on specific plants, but the pale striped flea beetle um, will feed on a variety of plants as well. 
Um, and the majority of the plague beetle issues we have here, or at least that we've, I've noticed, have to do more with your cold crop issues and things like that. So life cycle of the flea beetle, um, they live through the winter as adults in leaf litter, hedgerows, uh, windbreaks, all those things. And then they become active early in spring, depending on the species. Females will lay a singular cluster of eggs in the roots or soil or leaves, and then they'll come out and then still have these small white larvae that hatch um, from eggs and will actually feed on the roots of newly planted seedlings. Oh, that's great. And then those larvae will transform into pupae. So these have a complete TLC, have their complete life cycle. Um, and then usually in one or two generations, uh, they'll have one or two generations per year. What we found and what we've kind of noticed here in North Dakota with these guys, um, where they're the most common and tend, they tend to come in waves. Usually you have a spring wave and then you have a late summer wave. And I, 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 I it's not, nothing I've looked in extensively, but I have a feel, I have a theory why um usually you get them before the canola plants come up and then once that first canola field later in the summer is harvested they come back um so there and then we'll talk about how that timing and kind of understanding the timing of these guys and when they tend to show up um we'll have to do a lot with the management practices usually with these these guys are another one that's pretty easy to notice um, they're active during the day so usually if you're seeing the damage you'll also see the flea beetles unless it's old damage um, so this is some of the examples of what they will do. A lot of this kind of a spotted, um, you know, eaten looking leaf. And these were this example here with the actual flea beetles on there. But if you've dealt with flea beetles, you have a usually, even if you're not sure what they were, you'll probably recognize the damage with your full crops. All right. Um, next we're going to talk about a pest that's pretty it's pretty new but unbelievably devastating for our specialty crop fruits here um, in North Dakota and across the country sadly um that's the spotted wing drop still or the SWD fruit fly um these guys have spread across the United States within just you know five within just five years of its introduction to the continental U.S. um and now that it's been about 10 years they're just crazy these guys first were detected in about 2008 um and they were detected in more than 70 percent and they've now been affected they've, they've been found in about 70 percent of the states and that includes north dakota um it has a rapid spread uh and, and it really does have an invasive potential here in north dakota and it, what it really affects is a lot of your fruits so cherries um i know cherries are probably the biggest issue in the uh, farmer uh, especially crop producers have had with these guys um, tart cherries here and sweet cherries here in North Dakota, but they can also affect raspberries, um, strawberries, and if you're one of the few places in North Dakota where you can grow blueberries, they can have a pretty big effect as well. Um, and there's not a lot of info, we don't have a lot of understanding on how to deal with them, but there are some, some new research that's coming out, especially through the North Dakota State University Extension that we'll be going over in week four with these guys. Um, and they do prefer your, you know, a lot of your, your, your horticulture fruit species. So they're pretty, um, understanding and knowing how to identify these guys is pretty important if you do are a fruit producer. So these are all the, technically at this time, um, all of the counties where they have been identified. This might be a little bit of an older map in some counties they are. Um, a bit older than others, but something to be aware of. They, this, this fruit fly originated in Asia. Um, and it was detected in Hawaii about 1980. Um, and then by 2008, 2009, it really was started to see on the continental U.S. And by 2013, it spread to 36 states and most likely will continue to spread to the non-arid regions in the country as well. It was first detected in North Dakota in 2013. Um, and it's pretty widely believed to be distributed throughout the state. Um, and then it is a really invasive, it was first detected in Keratin, North Dakota um in 2013 so and that and as of 2013 since 2013 it's been found in 17 different counties in our state so it's becoming an issue and we really don't know how to deal with it yet but there's a lot of research being done um so with the adults how the best way to identify these guys is to look for the males there are some ways to identify the females about the um with the N, the omnipositor here, but you need almost a microscope. And the only way to really identify them for the naked eye is these male guys. So this is a male um, species. They have red eyes. Um, they're yellowish brown, and usually they'll have dark bands around the abdomen here. 
And then the way, and the way to really identify them, especially against other types of fruit flies, is the male will have that this black speck. Um, or black spot along the first vein near the tip of each wing. And that's what you're really gonna be looking for if you're gonna try to identify them with the naked eye. Um, and then, like I said, the females, you can identify them with the omnipositor, but it, you really almost need a magnifying magnifi magnification to be able to see that. And the males are probably the easiest way for you guys to identify these, these SWVs. Um, like I said before, they're invasive for a lot of your, uh, it's the most invasive for your small fruit flies. Uh, and it can be sometimes called the vinegar fly, but it is SWD. It tends to, in our state, primarily pat, attack, it does attack grapes, raspberry, your saskatoons, um, tart cherries, and strawberries, and again, native to Asia. Uh, and it's not all primary fruit growing regions of the, and it's found in most primary fruit regions of, North, of the U.S. So this is how you would kind of identify, hopefully this is past, once you can see the larva, you're almost too late. You're not, it's gonna be a hard time to deal with this pest. Um, this is what you'd be looking for. Um, they, they, the SWD lays um, their, these maggots or lays their eggs directly into the fruit, right? And the thing that makes these guys devastating is they don't lay the eggs until the fruit is, has hit exact ripeness. Um, so the minute that your fruit ripe, the, these guys are on it laying these little mag, these little, their eggs and getting these little maggots in them. Um, they're white. The maggots are, they don't have legs or really ahead. They look like these little clear or white specks. Um, and they only are about an, 18, an eighth of an inch long. And, they are, and they will cause these, these dimples or, or dents inside the fruit and then cause the fruit to rot from the inside out. Um, so this is in cherries, and then this is an example, raspberries, strawberries, and cherries again, um, with the fruit fly adults present as well. And we'll get more into monitoring um, next week, but this is kind of the trap that they have developed to build and monitor these guys to see if they're present. And the idea is you use a, stick, a yellow sticky card in like a deli container, and then there's apple vinegar, or they can use a sluice, I mean cider vinegar or something along those lines, or a solution to attract them through with little holes in the top. And we'll get into it a little bit later. Um, and, but the biggest thing I know when we talk about management with these guys is monitoring and knowing when you have them present is your, really your big first step. And then you want to get those yellow cards. You can see there is a difference between, you know, your average fruit flies and then these adult SWVs with that black spot and those red eyes. All right. Okay, we're almost halfway through the course and, uh, and I, when we're halfway through the slides. So I know we're on a good roll here. Um, the next pest we're going to talk about is not actually an insect, of course, and that's a slug. Um, I know a lot of people have had issues with slugs, uh, and then they're usually, you're going to see them a lot of times on like your cabbages, your cauliflower, your coals, um, and then also they can affect your fruit bearing uh, crops like your tomatoes and uh, green peppers and things like that as well. Uh, but slugs are these small, slimy, soft bodied insects, and usually most people when they see the slug, they know they have a slug issue. But we're going to try also, I'm going to show you guys some pictures of slug damage because sometimes you'll have the slug damage, but you won't be able to find the actual slug. Um, and so, and especially since a lot of times they uh, feed at night and then they hide during the day. So you may not notice the actual insect until you have the issue. Uh, but these guys will also feed on leaves of many plants, especially seedlings, ripening fruits, vegetables, and of course decaying matter as well. And they tend to increase in population during the rainy season um, or, uh, and on really well irrigated gardens. So slugs tend to like a lot of moisture. Um, so if you have a very, you know, if you have a lot of mulching or if you have, an, you have a really humid or wet period or summer, you probably will have more slug issues. So the slug life cycle, um, usually they start out as a batch of eggs. Um, sorry, let's start, let's go a little bit farther. So in the fall, the slugs lay their translucent eggs on their plant debris, and then those eggs will hatch in the spring, and the slugs will start feeding on strawberries in the spring and then early summer, anything they can really get a hold of. And then they have a layer of slime to protect their skin from drying out. And then they will, when they move, you'll actually see a slime trail, which can, which can actually help you identify their presence. So you may not be able to see the adult slime, Plug, but you might actually see the trail it leaves behind. And then also they have a structure called a radula, which contains small little teeth, and that's what's actually damaging your fruit. Um, and they also will scrape or cut food before it's eating it, so it'll break down that outer layer. 
Alrighty. So some damage, this is some really good looking look at some damage um, done by slugs. Like I said, they have that file mouth part to rasp and chew plant tissue. So they will leave spots or open areas or like gouges in the fruit that they're eating on. Um, and they'll create some really irregular shaped holes in their reef of fruit, like you can see on this kale here. Um, and in some cases with severe damage, these guys can, if you've got a ton of them, they can completely be like defoliate, eat off all of the leaves off some, um, some young plants. And then, so that's the downside, they can destroy your young plants and then they can ruin, even though technically these tomatoes would still be edible, I don't know, I would eat them, but you're definitely not gonna be able to sell them. So even if you have one slug bite, you've just lost your market value with these guys. Um, and usually with um, the thing with slugs is damage can be unnoticeable um, oh, until it actually starts, they start growing in numbers. And then when you have large numbers of snow logs, you can get a lot of damage to your crop. So it's just kind of an example to look for. If you're seeing this kind of damage and you're not sure what's going on and you don't see an insect present, the thing to look for is this, you know, are these big irregular shapes in the leaves or foliage or are these like these holes almost in your fruit. So this example of slug damage. And then as a, I thought this photo was a really good example because a lot of your fruits sometimes, especially if you're not in a high tunnel or something along those lines, is you will get bird predation. But there is a really good way to kind of tell. You can see the difference right here with the strawberry, the difference between a slug and then maybe something that's eating on it might be a bird. So slugs, you know, it's almost like the inside's a little bit hollowed out, whereas a bird, you can kind of definitely see where it's been pecking at it. So there is a bit of a difference, and it's good to know what you're looking at. All right, and so that's slugs. Next, we're going to talk about cabbage moths. Um, so in reality, cabbage moths are about, are actually, if you, or what we tend to call cabbage moths in the garden, are actually about three different species of, of caterpillar slash worm, uh, you know, caterpillar worms or moths. Um, and, depending, uh, and depending on what species it is, tells you what part of that life cycle they eat. Um, but I'm going to go over the three main ones you're going to be seeing that tend to be labeled as cabbage moths. Um, and these guys usually go after pole crops, cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, radishes, turnips, collard, greens, all that good stuff. Um, they're really fun to have if you have them. <laughs> Not really. Um, the most common caterpillar pest, and they are probably the most common caterpillar pest, um, would be the cabbage worm with, or the cabbage looper or the diamondback moth, which are all three things we're going to go over um, once I get in the next couple of slides. And usually the imported cabbage worms are the most common caterpillars found in gardens. And then all caterpillars will usually feed, so out of all these three species, the caterpillars will feed between large veins and midribs of the coal crops. And then the older caterpillars um, can cause the most feeding damage. So first we're gonna talk about the imported cabbage worm. This is, so it's then a picture of the adult, the actual caterpillar, and then the egg form here. Uh, usually the adult butterflies, your, your, um, the, up here you see, are usually seen flying around plants during the day. So these are one of those ones you'll see during the day. It's, so that's why it's a butterfly, not a moth. Um, there's a couple other reasons why, there, if you don't know the difference, but I could get into that all day. Um, but the adult are white butterflies with those black spots on the forewings, you can kind of see right there. And then their eggs are yellow and oblong, or kind of whitish, and they both appear on lower upper and the lower sides of the leaves. And then the caterpillars can grow one inch in length and are velvety green with faint, you can see here, faint yellow stripes running lengthwise um, down the back. And they move um, pretty sluggishly if you were to prod at them. So that's a good way to, to kind of understand these imported cabbage worms. Um, and then we're gonna talk about the cabbage looper. So this is an actual moth. The, the moths are nocturnal, so you're not gonna see the adults until at night. Um, they have one and a half inch wingspan, and they usually have that molted grayish brown wings. And then um, small, silvery white figure eights in the middle of each of their front wings. The eggs are a creamy white, and they're very, very tall, um, aspirin shaped, and about the size of a pinhead. So they're even much smaller than that, um, that cabbage, the, the imported cabbage worm uh, egg. The caterpillars are a really pale green with narrow white lines um, running down each side. And usually the full grown will be only about an inch and a half long. And they, the cabbage looper caterpillars will have, where we talked about, will actually have no legs in their middle section. So they get that really kind of um, snake uh, shape along there with that looping motion. 
uh, and that allows them to, they cause a loopy motion as they move across uh, vegetation as well. And then the last but not least, your diamond back moths. And there's your, your picture of the adult and then, all, and then also the caterpillar. Um, the moths are really light brown and very slender. They have full, the folded wings will show a pattern of three white diamonds as you kind of see in that photo. And then the eggs are laid near leaf veins on the leaf and are creamy white and tiny. I don't have pictures of those. Um, and then the caterpillars are really light green and then are tapered at both ends. And they're only about a third of an inch long, um, much smaller than your cabbage worms and cabbage loopers. And they will wiggle a ton when you touch them, whereas the others are a bit more sedated. And then the damage you're gonna be looking for when you have cabbage moth issue, issues are what you're looking at right here. Um, so these guys, you should be, usually it's a lot of times the caterpillars that are causing the most damage. And so they will be present when you, um, if you look hard enough and look around where you're seeing the damage on your plants or, or monitoring. Um, but you'll get these, you know, these holes. This is some cab, this is an example right here with those little black brown specks. That's really, if you know what caterpillar poop looks like, that's what it looks like. They give off, they eat so much, they poop a ton. So you should be, if you're seeing these little holes or a bunch of holes in your, your coal crops, look for the, look for little brown specks that kind of tend to conjugate together because that's going to be another sign you have some type of cabbage moth uh, caterpillar because they'll have, and this is I believe kind of cauliflower, they'll give off a lot of poop behind them. And if you look really closely at that poop, it almost looks accordion shaped. It's very gridded. Um, but that's so two, some really good examples of when you have, you know, you have a cabbage moth issue, one of those, probably one of those three species. All right, we'll keep going. Um, so next we're gonna have about spider mites. Um, so again, spider mites are not insects, they are arachnids. Um, all arachnids, including mites, have two main parts on um, their bodies, mate legs, and the spot, two-spotted spider mite can infest over 200 species of plants. Um, the good news about these guys, um, even though they can affect outdoor plants, um, usually when you, we see them, especially crop producers, and when they're really, really bad issues with their infestation with these guys, it's in high tunnel settings or in controlled environment settings, like in a greenhouse or something like that. So if you're growing crops out in an outdoor, uh, an outdoor field or garden, you're probably not going to have to worry as much about these guys. And if you're seeing something, some damage you're not sure of, um, and you're in an outside, outside setting, these may, it may not be spider mites. Um, and they can, and severe spider mite feeding can stunt a plant's growth, and it can even kill the plant. And these guys really, if you've had cucumbers in a high tunnel or any of your cucumber bits, cucumbers, um, these guys tend to really get at those as well. So how do you identify spider mites? The issue with spider mites is unless you, once you see the obvious damage of these guys, it's almost too late. Um, so they're kind of hard to identify before they become a really big, huge problem. But if you're able to, um, if you know you've had spider mite issues in the past or have a crop that might be successful to or uh, spider mites, uh, you can always use a magnifying glass and, you know, a piece of paper. And we'll talk about that in scouting and how to get, figure out and get hold of these guys. Uh, but they can be found in citrus trees, evergreen, bedding plants, and our annual garden plants. So they're a little bit of everything. Um, they like, so they like your garden plants like marigolds and patience, salvia, viola. I've seen them on petunias. Um, but the, for your specialty crop vegetable producers, these guys are really prominent on cucumbers, snap, beans, peas, tomatoes and lettuce, and they can also be an issue on berries such as black, uh, strawberries, blackberries, blueberries, and that's two things we probably don't have here in North Dakota, but they can be an issue. Um, and they usually happen, and the infestations usually happen or common during hot, dry summer weather. So how do you identify spider mites? These guys are tiny, they're talking 150 of an inch long. They have yellow, orange in color and dark spots on one, uh, each, on each side of their body. And usually if there's a really heavy infestation, which is usually when it's when it's the only time when like, producers tend to actually notice them uh, before and that they're not, they don't know what to look for is when you'll see some webbing. They'll get this, this really light webbing around the plant. And that is a really strong indication that you have a spider mite issue. And I'll show you a picture in a little bit, a few slides, what that looks for. 
And so here's the, the life cycle of these guys. They live in the winter as eggs in the veg on vegetation. They hatch in about one to two weeks um, under high temperatures, 90, over 90 degrees. Again, this is why they do so well in high tunnels here in North Dakota. Um, they can reach really high numbers in less than two weeks. And then once they hatch, they'll build colonies on the underside of leaves and then produce webbing over an infested leaf over time. Um, and that's why the webbing, that's what gives them that spider mite name. And this is an example of the spider mites. And this, you, to be able to see it this clearly as you see in this picture, you would need a magne magnifying glass or some way to magnify that. All right. And then spider mite damage. They really cause this kind of speckling on the leaves, especially like on cucumbers, it's pretty common to see if you're seeing that kind of damage. And then this is the example of what the webbing would look like. And sometimes you wouldn't be able to even see the mite, you'd just see webbing all along the plant or certain leaves that they've infested. All right, so that comes to an end of all my bug or insect related pest issues. Like I said, it is not even coming close to covering all of the pests out there. Um, you know, one of them I can think of right now, which I wish I had had time to go over would be the, um, the, the, the gourd, the gourd boar, um, you know, that helped like, a lot of the issues with, with uh, some of your, your gourd families and things like that. Uh, I just didn't have time and I really wanted to try to get the really most common one. A lot of the especially crop producers in North Dakota have expressed to me. And then, like I said, if you ever need, have any help, need help identifying a pest, um, you can always let me know. And then also North Dakota State University does have a entomology lab where they can, if through pictures or even through, you know, for, through email, and then also that you can even send in samples to identify. And as long as they don't have to do any kind of genetic testing, a lot of time for, you know, residential producers, they'll do that service for free. So if you're ever looking to really identify a type of insect pest, um, your North Dakota State University, University Extension is a great resource to use. So the last part of our uh, of our session today, I'm going to be going over fungal, bacterial, and viral diseases, and there are a ton out there. I mean, a ton of different types. A lot of fungal and a lot of bacterial and viral diseases are can be very specific to a specific crop, but I wanted to kind of hit the four top ones that I have had expressed to me, and then we also did looked at in with some of our research. Um, and, and a lot of times viral and bacterial diseases and like this are probably the hardest thing to identify, especially to be able to tell sometimes the difference between this and some type of pest issue versus some type of nutrition issue. And sometimes the best way to try, if you're really having an issue with these guys, is going through your local extension office um, to help you identify that. Because there are, and it may, with a small fee, they can test plant tissue and things like that this for different bacterial issues. But the great thing is, um, with dealing with a lot of these and managing a lot of these different pests or bacterial issues, um, the management is not species or even disease um, di um, disease separate. So pretty much the same thing you can do for a bacterial disease. A lot of times, a lot of the simple management practices to deal with that can be also be applied to the fungal or virus. Or it's very it kind of it covers all of your pathogens together. Some of the the things you can do to help prevent spread and then also prevent um, dealing with these these issues in a more, in a less chemical pesticide way, more of a management way. But like I said, we're gonna go over downy mildew, early blight, bacterial speck, and mosaic virus. And I'm probably going to talk a little bit, some of these you'll notice tend to be more on the, the nightshade family, but I, I feel like a lot, almost no matter what producer you are, a um, majority of you are gonna be doing night, some type of nightshade family produ uh, producing, um, especially crops, so that's why I kind of picked these guys. So before we get into these, uh, into these different diseases and pathogens, I want to kind of go over the plant disease triangle. And this is, this is honestly the triangle for all disease, human, plant, you name it. Um, but usually the way the triangle is described is you have a pathogen. To have a, path, if you have, if, to have a disease, you have to have all three of these factors. So you have to have the pathogen, the thing that's actually causing the infection, a host, something for that's susceptible to the infection, and then an environment that's favorable to the, path, the infection as well. Um, so your pathogen example would be your fungi, your bacteria, nematodes, virulent pathogen, all of that stuff. Um, the host would be your susceptible crop or cultivar. And then favorable temperament environment could be humidity, it could be soil moisture, it could be soil pH, fertility, air temperature, soil temperature, all of that. 
Um, and really when I came, when I was talking about last week about a happy plant is a healthy plant, um, that can be really, really strongly applied to plant disease management because the stronger and healthier your plant is or your crop is, the better, just like us as humans or mammals or things like that, the better you're going to be able to fight off and deal with pathogen issues or disease issues, um, even more so than even it's the pest issues. I mean, eventually, you know, along those lines and preventing that spread as well. So that is our disease triangle. So you have to always, if you, and the great thing about disease, dealing with these diseases is if you're able to eliminate any one of these corners of the triangle, then you might be able to deal with it. So it's usually hard to get rid of the pathogen or the host because the host usually is the crop you want to grow. The pathogen, that's the whole point. So usually the favorable environment is where a lot of the management practices we'll talk about in week four of how you can um, eliminate these environmental factors to prevent that spread of that, that disease. All right, so the first we'll talk about is downy mildew, and I'm gonna separate it out because they're, usually your producers have tend to go to one of two ways. Um, if you're a basil producer, usually you'll have, um, there is a specific downy mildew for basil, and then the, the downy mildew is one of those um, diseases that is very, family, if not species specific. There's a downy mildew for impatiens, there's a downy mildew for different bedding plants, but these two, the downy mildew for basil and then the one that tends to affect cucumber, melons, and squash are the two I'm going to go over today. So basil downy mildew, as you can see in these photos, um, can spread really rapidly and result in a lot of yield loss. Um, the infection usually starts on lower leaves and will move up the plant. Um, it can cause, downy, downy mildew can cause, um, can be transmitted on seed um, and transplants or fresh leaves. There really, there are really no resistant varieties of sweet basil available to downy mildew. Um, and usually it takes a lot of monitoring of seedlings and transplanting plants closely for yellowing leaves or gray downy growth on the lower leaf surface if you're buying plugs or something along those lines. Make sure you're getting clean product if you're, if you're not starting them from seed yourself. Um, but there are certain fungicides that can help protect and we'll go against this and other practices we'll talk about in a few, um, in a few weeks. So when you're trying to identify downy mildew in your build in symptoms in your basil, um, if, like I said before, look if you're seeing it's going to affect your lower leaves and then move up the plant. Um, usually leaves when they first are infected will turn yellow in areas restricted um, by major veins and then over time the entire leaf turns yellow. And you can also get your regular black spots that appear on affected leaves as they age. And then fluffy gray spores will grow on the underside of the infected leaves, as you can see here. So then um, we have our downy mildew for cucumber, melon, and squash. And this is actually a really great, um, a really great figure kind of showing the different varieties and how downy mildew affects each one. Um, but it can infect all cucumber it fits, including cucumber, melon, pumpkin, squash, everything in that family. Uh, it thrives in really wet or humid conditions um, as a water mold. And then usually it's a pale, it will cause pale green or yellow spots on the upper surface of the leaves and then later turn brown. Um, and then this guy, this, this type of mildew, downy, downy mildew can move on air currents and then also splashing water and on tools and hands of workers. So it's pretty easy to spread once it's, it, it's been there. And then again, but there are some plant resistant varieties out there. Um, and when we talked about cultural control with integrated pest management, it sometimes comes down to just, you know, utilizing um, plant varieties that are already resistant to whatever pest issue you have. And there are some fungicides out there as well. Um, so downy mildew, um, it's not actually a true fungus, it's an omocyte, and I'm not sure if I'm even saying it right, but again, it thrives in really wet and humid conditions, and when you're trying to identify these guys, you're gonna, it's very similar to that, that um, in, with the, the basil, where you're going to get some leaf spots, it's, or actually, you're going to still get some more of the leaf spots with the gray fuzzy forms on the underside of the leaves, um, this is not something you're going to have to worry about looking at the bottom of the plant. It tends to just cause pale green and yellow spots on the upper surface leaves, and then later those will turn brown. Uh, and then uh, leaf spots grow together, entire leaf will eventually turn brown, and then the leaves appear if frost might have killed them. So if you're seeing like something that looks like frost kill and it's the middle of July, you might have a downy mildew uh, issue. And then on watermelons especially, you'll notice 
um, down this below, very last four pictures, there is an exaggerated upward leaf curling um, that's pretty common to that to downy mildew and watermelon species. All right, we have about 10 more minutes and a few more slides. Perfect timing. Um, so the next we're going to talk about is early blight. Um, so early blight is ten, tends to be more of a tomato um, or um, and or something along the lines in the nightshade family, especially on tomatoes, it's probably seen the most of. And a lot of times when producers are having issues, it has to do with, um, I, tend, I tend to hear it ends up being early blight because um, it is one of the most common tomato diseases and it, it, it's occurring nearly every season um, wherever tomatoes are grown. So it's pretty widespread across the United States. It will affect the leaves, the fruit, the stems, um, and it can also really, really much, do a lot of limiting um, to your, your overall yield. yield. Um, and then there are certain cultivars that are more susceptible to it than others, so other varieties, different varieties um, are more susceptible to it. And then also it can cause severe defoliation, which can result in sun scald on your fruit. And then early blight is also both common in field and high tunnel production as well. So it's not one of those um, issues where it can, it would you only see it one or the other. So um, these guys, uh, early blight is, for, is usually caused by two different closely related fungi. Uh, I'm not gonna go and try to explain the name of these guys, um, but one of them is a bit more virulent than the other. So um, you, sometimes you might have both present in a night region, sometimes one or the other. It really kind of just depends, but those are, usually it's two varieties that you're gonna see the most of. Um, something also to understand is early blight can affect potatoes, um, though it's usually, uh, and can cause early blight on potato crops, but a lot of times, and they have been known to affect eggplant as well, so like I said, that nightshade family, uh, but you tend to see more issues with tomatoes. And the way you would um, identify these guys, and it can affect everything. It can identify, it can affect the fruit. Um, it can, but majority of the time it's going to affect the leaves, but it can also then affect the stems as well. But usually you're going to see it in the leaves. So when you're looking for it on your leaves, you're going to see small dark spots with older foliage near the ground. Um, the spots are going to be round and brown and can grow up to about half an inch in diameter. And then usually it's something that really helps you understand what, uh, really know what you're looking at, is they've got these target-like centric greens, as you can see in this far um, top left picture, um, where the tissue around the spot often turns yellow, and then really infected leaves will go all the way brown and then fall off. Um, or if you have dead, dry leaves, that will then still cling to the stem. But really, if you see spots where you're seeing these greens here, um, that is a really, uh, good indication that you have early blight. That being said, this is one of the ones that can also, if you're not really sure what you have, especially when we're going back over a lot of these different fungi and bacterial infections and viral infections, is they, they can be tested as well in a lab. Um, some of the environments that really um, do, help this do well is it usually does not develop until it, it likes moderate to warm temperatures, 59 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So um, if you're having really hot days, you may not see an issue as much. Um, and then also really rainy weather, heavy dew, humidity in general, or if you're in an area that has a lot of really high humidity, like 90% or higher, you're going to have more chances of this developing as well because it really likes really wet, humid um, moderately warm temperatures. But if you live in a really dry, arid area or you're having a very dry, um, hot summer, um, it might actually help with this if you've had issues with it in the past. All right. And then um, we're going to go on to bacterial speck and spots. Another one for, that has to do a lot more with your tomato plants. Um, but it can be, and majority of the time, it's tomatoes, but again, a lot of your, your nightshade families as well. And the reason I say speck and spots because um, there are two different bacterial diseases, bacterial speck and bacterial spot, but a lot of times spot, a lot of times they can be interchanged and the way of dealing with them is about the same. Um, they usually will improve. Um, uh, some ways you can deal with these guys we'll talk about later. Uh, but something really important is you would never want to save seed from infected plants. If you have any type of bacterial speck or spot, 
um, spot. Um, this is a bacteria that can go through, that can stay in the seed and infect the seed as well. Um, and then something that's kind of nice about the leaf spots uh, shouldn't, if, if you don't have it on your actual fruit, but just on your leaves of the plant, it shouldn't affect the amount of fruit your plants can produce unless you get these, you get the speck on the actual fruit itself. So um, bacterial speck is a disease that's similar to bacterial spot, like I said. Uh, bacterial speck and spot can, also, can cause spots to form in the leaves, stem, or fruit of the tomato plant. Um, leaf spots are caused usually by bacterial speck and spot um, will look identical, but you can tell them apart by different types of fruit spots that form later in the season. So speck, speck infections on fruit are small, about the size of a pencil tip, um, raised black spots, whereas um, bacterial spots on fruit are much larger, about the size of a pencil eraser. So you can kind of see the difference here in these two photos. Um, and then something um, always important, you don't want um, do not, can't, you don't want to, if you have tomatoes, even, if, you know, technically that looks edible, it depends on what your choices are, but if you ha know you have bacterial speck or spot, you should not can infect a tomato because these diseases can change the pH of the fruit. So that's something to remember with this, if you're seeing this disease on your fruit, is do not can them because it can, this bacteria can affect your, your, your canning pH. Oops, sorry about that. Um, and then what to look for. So like I said before, uh, there are three leaf spot diseases commonly found in North Dakota, Minnesota areas like that. Um, and so you have your leaf spot and your bacterial spot and then early blight, which sometimes we just talked about can be, can, can be traded through these guys. But at the early stage of the disease, uh, these guys are all really hard to tell apart. Um, spot, blight, and speck. Uh, but manager practices, um, like we'll talk about later, all work work the same for all three diseases across the board, so that's good to know. And then most tomato leaf spot diseases will overwinter in the soil and then splash on lower leaves of the plant, which is why the lower, older leaves tend to be affected sooner. Um, and then as a result, those first leaf spots can be found on the lowest leaves closest to the ground. And usually you're going to want to look for brown or black round spots that are the size of a pencil tip or larger. And remember we talked about on um, really the only way you can tell the speck and spot apart is how it affects the fruit. Whereas the leaves, um, it's pretty similar on how they affect. All right, and then our last but not least of all of our, and we have a few more minutes left, um, is the virus, our mosaic virus. Um, this is again, the mosaic virus. There's lots of different types of mosaic viruses that affect different species and families of plants. We're gonna talk about the tomato and tobacco mosaic virus, which sometimes can go hand in hand. Um, and both tend to affect a lot of our nightshade families again. Um, so your uh, tomato virus infects tomatoes most commonly. But what you can affect peppers, potatoes, apples even, um, pears, cherries, numerous weeds, um, including pigweed and lambs quarters as well. So remember we talked about environment or susceptible host. So one of the reasons why weeding can be so important is that your pigweed and lambs quarter growing next to your nightshade plants could be a, a, you know, a host for bringing this mosaic virus into your crop. Um, symptoms may differ on different hosts depending what they have, um, but the tomato virus, so the, the, the most tomato mosaic virus has a very wide range of um, host range. Um, again, it can, it can handle a lot of stuff and they can affect a lot of stuff as well, both the tobacco and tomato. All right, and tomato, so like I said, the tobacco mosaic virus can do your weeds, your apples, your fruits, and then the, the, the tomato mosaic virus can also affect cucumbers, lettuce, beets, peppers, all those different things as well. So they did between those two, and they're kind of hard to tell the difference unless you have them looked up, um, you know, actually sent in to, to be tested, but the symptoms can be pretty similar. So overall, the tomato mosaic virus symptoms can be varied and pretty hard to distinguish from a lot of other common tomato viruses. Uh, so that's why I said um, you're, the best way if you think you have this or something similar, some type of virus, is you're going to probably have to send some type of tissue sample. And we do have North Dakota State University Extension does have a plant diagnostic lab. And sometimes they can tell just by pictures and things like that. But with this guy, you'll probably need some type of tissue sample. And the cost can range anywhere from $20 to $60. Um, and so depending on how important it is to you and how large the production is to know what you're dealing with, that's gonna, you're gonna have to make that decision as a producer. 
some of the symptoms and things to look for, though, if you'd like to you know, kind of have an idea if this could be a possibility, is it'll cause a mod, it will cause a model light or dark green on leaves. And usually plants are infected early, they'll actually appear yellow and stunted um, growth overall. So if they usually seen a lot of stunting and you're not sure, it's, you know it's not a nutrition issue or something like that, it could be a virus. Um, leaves may be curled or malformed or reduced in size as, as they grow. And then you'll sometimes get spots of dead tissue that may become apparent with certain cultivars at warm temperatures. Um, fruit, another, another symptom could be your fruit is ripening unevenly. Um, or your fruit has a reduced number or size. And then another, right, you can look for yellowish rings that can form in your fruit as it ripens in the warm weather. Uh, and then fruits may also show internal browning just under the skin, which is called brown wall. So it's a bit, it's probably out of all of the diseases we talked about, it's one of the hardest ones to pinpoint because there's a lot of different types of symptoms it could have. But if you have any of these one symptoms, um, it might be worth your time to look into it, but like we all know about viruses, viruses are hard to treat um, by themselves once they're, they're present, besides trying to prevent um, spread or management um, like um, that. So again, a lot of when we get into the management of a lot of these pests and disease issues, um, a lot of the management practices of either preventing or reducing the spread of this type of disease or virus is very similar to the, the fungal and the bacterial uh, diseases as well. And a lot of times it'll come down to sanitation. And we'll get into that again, like I said, in about four weeks, two more weeks at the end of, the end of May. All right, so we're a little bit past one, I apologize. But the last thing I wanted to show you guys, and I will open it through questions as well. So I found that, you know, you, you have issues or you're trying to diagnose an issue with your plant, be it a, a bug or a disease or something like that. You can always contact me here at Dakota College at Botno, Amy Kohler, um, you know, or our DCB Horticulture Facebook page. We can always try to help you out. But a really great online resource is, um, it's called What's Wrong With My Plant? It's a page by the University of Minnesota Garden Extension. And it's a really great uh, way to break down what's your issue. So it, it, it's, it has a lot of pictures and it shows you, okay, what, kind of, what type of plant is it? And then what's, what are the symptoms? Is it a leaf symptom? Is it a eating symptom? And it breaks it down and takes you step by step to help you discover what possibly could be your pest issue. And then once you kind of figure out what you think your pest issue is, they have a tons of resources of what um, what causes it, and then also management practices as well, common ones um, for that pest. So really great resource. Um, you can find it at um, extension.umn.edu slash garden slash diagnose slash plant, or just Google what's wrong with my plant U of M and you should be able to find it. It's our University of Minnesota and you should be able to find it. Really great resource. Um, and a lot of this information that I was able to glean and put together today I was able to utilize, like I gave them, and I gave them acknowledgement in the beginning of the PowerPoint, um, just a lot of great, and then NDSU Extension also has a lot of great pest and disease um, information as well, and a lot of great research going on, like I spent, mentioned before with the SWB. So before I let you guys go today and end um, our webinar, is there any questions or concerns or thoughts that you'd like to bring up now? Oh, that's, that's good again. I guess questions are always, no questions, I guess, are always good. And that's mean I must cover the material pretty well. Um, so please feel, please remember to join us next Tuesday at noon. We're going to talk about, uh, the, oh, I see some, I see, do I have chat maybe? Oh, there is some chats. Did I miss them? Oh, thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks for the great, uh, very complete. I, I appreciate that. So next week we're going to talk about scouting and monitoring. So once so now that we know how to identify our plants, we need to go through the steps of how do we de how do we know we have the issue if we know what we're if we know what we're looking like for. Let's figure out how to go looking for them because scouting and monitoring is a big part of pest management, and then if, uh, and that's what we're going to be going over some basic steps and procedures and tips and ideas of how to scout and monitor. Um, and do some different monitoring practices and integrated pest management. And then of course, the final week will be the actual um, integrated pest management practices that can be utilized for the different pests we went over today. Um, so if there's any pests that I may have missed or you'd really like to learn some more management ideas or thoughts behind, feel free to mess with some BCB horticulture and I'll try to include that um, with our week four presentation as well uh, of any pests I might, that you would like me to talk about that I haven't talked about already. But if that's all, I'm going to say goodbye to everybody and thank you so much for joining us and I'll see you next week on Tuesday. 
Bye.